welcome to episode 39 of a Thai football podcast with me, Dale Farrington. And me, Rob Bernard. And as you've probably gathered, we're back in the studio this week. Yeah, I'm down in Bangkok for a, a week or so before heading to Chiang Mai. And I'm in the beautiful English Lake District, inside, with the heating on, keeping out of the wet, the cold and the grey. But I'm OK. It's, it's nice to be back in some respects. I said at the end of last week's programme it would be spring when I came back. It's still very much winter up here in Cumbria. Uh, we've still got a couple of fans on here in the condo trying to keep cold. Don't rub it in, Rob. <laughs> Anyway, we've got a lot going on this week. We're going to start with League Cup action from last Wednesday. And we've got Risa to kick off the programme. And he's taken a little bit of a different tack this week, as you'll hear when we play Risa's match report from Ratbury's game against Bangkok United. Ties to the podcast. Match reports. Good evening from Dragon Solar Park. Today the match is Thai League Revo Cup round of 16 between Rajaburi FC and Bangkok United. We are now in the 90th minute already. At a time, 5 minutes and Rajaburi now leading 1-0. We are seeing a very fantastic match but Rajaburi same come out on top with one goal scored by Tyron Del Pino. Now we are Rajaburi fans, Dragons are expecting the referee to blow the whistle to let us go through to the quarterfinals. The match itself showing two goalkeepers that should be in the national team. One has already been called up from Bangkok United and the other one come on leading the goalkeeper record, the best goalkeeper in the Thai League at the moment. Well, that is what it is. We just can hope for the best and hope Ishii, the national team that is here today, he can realize what he has done. There it is, the final whistle. Rajaburi won, Bangkok United 0, and the Dragons qualify to the quarterfinals. We are going through. Come on, you Dragons. Well, I wasn't expecting that, Dale. He's just fired up, isn't he? Yeah, I can see his point, you know, with Kampon. But Patty Watt's done nothing wrong, has he, in goal for Thailand? You know, it's very difficult for Ishii, and he's fortunate to have two good goalies. I think we're all the same when it comes to our clubs, aren't we? we? You know, we all cry out for our players to be included. I mean, we see them every single week, so we like to think we've got a better insight than a national team coach who probably just sees them every so often. But what I enjoyed about Reza's report this week was he was there in the moment wasn't he he was right in it and you could sense the excitement in his voice and it was a fantastic result for a team that are just on fire at the moment well that must help I mean Craig if you can't get excited with this run that Ratbury are on I tell you they're a good side be inter- interesting to watch how they go on next season if there's none of these upheavals during the close season which they're renowned for I think if they can take the momentum of the way they're playing in the second leg over next year they could be top four finishers couldn't they they could and they've obviously got something right there behind the scenes you know there's a lot of doom and gloom about losing a major sponsor but not a bit of it it's great so we'll, we'll keep our eye on Ratbury and obviously with Reese sending in his reports every week I wonder where he's going to go next <laughs> how do you top that well very difficult I mean it, it might be a more measured approach we, we need to draw Reese get you back down to earth anyway League Cup did you manage to see any of the games Rob I did I watched the uh, Pratt up against Port game Tardelli with an absolute thunderbolt in that a polished performance from Port and then I flicked over and saw from the second half extra time and penalties of Burram and Utaitani and what a good game Burram are very entertaining at the moment and uh, I did mention that uh, I thought Utaitani were a good side uh, when they played at Port and as an attacking force they certainly are did you have any experience of the Cup this week? Oh do you really want to know? Uh, Come on. That was that was the day I was flying back to England and I had planned to try and catch the Chombury Bangkok Glass game at Stockholm Airport, but I had a, a nightmare trip back. Flights delayed, missed connections, an extra flight added. So in the end, I only saw about the first 10, 15 minutes and we were one up. And then obviously, when I got to my next stop, Copenhagen, I found out we'd lost 4-1. So in, in, in some respects, it was probably a blessing that things didn't go exactly to plan on Wednesday. It was certainly an interesting day. Well, an interesting day and a half. And a pointer to your form, 
and uh, bringing them luck. Well, it can't be denied now, <laughs> can it? Um, I well, will be writing to the club first thing tomorrow morning. I expect a business class flight being booked for you. Absolutely. I'll, I'll settle for nothing less. But I've got it all mapped out. There's a little graph of our performances when I'm in the country, when I'm at the match... And then when I'm out of the country and when I don't see the match, it's very detailed. So I'm hoping they'll spend some time pouring over it and then offer to fly me back for the rest of the season. <laughs> oh, well. well, we'll see. I'll give you an update next week. I'm, I'm not holding my breath, if I'm being honest. No, no, no. Very realistic. Coming up next, I sat down to have a chat with Grant Aiken, the Mung Tong fan, about something that deserved a little bit more attention. It seems to have kind of slipped by with very few people noticing. But Cowan's return at Mung Tong has got to be one of the big stories of the season. So I had a talk with Grant, and this is what he said about the goalkeeper coming back to his club after a bit of time away and making a, first to say, an unexpected comeback between the sticks. Time for more podcasts. Welcome back, Grant. It's lovely to have you on the podcast again. No, thank you for having me back, Dale. How have you been? Pretty good. Had a, a new baby daughter arrived uh, two months ago, so a bit of a change since the last time that we spoke. So keeps me busy, but I'm still following the Thai football. Right, congratulations. That's that's great thank news. You. And have you got a deck out in red and black already? It mainly pinks at the moment, but yeah, g- give me okay. some time. I'll uh, I'll get a fresh shirt sorted out as soon as I can. Do they make them in that size? It's a little bit of a pet peeve. I, I've got a son, and they used to do a range. I think 2017 was the last time, but maybe it wasn't that profitable so they've stopped producing the ones for the younger sizes so if anybody's listening I'd, I'd be very happy if they made smaller sizes but at the moment no just seems to be catering for the adults so Stephen Romery if you're listening to this yeah. there you go there's something for you to get your teeth into anyway you're here today to talk about Cowan's comeback what are your thoughts on it? to be honest I think there was mixed feelings at the time not just from me but from what I gathered from social media that when he returned, I, I think at the time we still had some pawn and he was playing very well for us, but his contract was running out. So maybe the board knew something we didn't. And then halfway through the season, he left for port. But at the time he was doing a great job. We had Mario as coach and some pawn was pretty crucial because he was very good with his feet. He played Mario style and the fans were a little bit worried that Gowing couldn't adapt. We know he's a great shot stopper. We know he's a commanding goalkeeper, but there was fears whether he could fit into that system. Fast forward now, when he's actually finally made his debut, Mario's no longer there. We're playing a different style and he's come in, he's fit like a glove. Yeah, he's kind of done a, a 180. At the time, fans were were happy to have him back because he's a legend, but there were some worries, completely put to bed because he, he's been absolutely brilliant since he's, he's now returned to full fitness and he's playing again. Was the intention always to get him playing again? My understanding was he'd come back as part of the coach staff under Mario is that right um, I'm not sure if that was the initial intention although there's not always a great deal of information that's put out for the public so behind the scenes I don't know the fans expectation was that he would be playing we didn't think it would take as long as it did because we're talking like a season and a half now because he, he signed at the start of last season never played he switched to a coaching role and he wasn't taking his full salary he was taking a coach's salary instead but I'm sure initially the deal was for him to sign as a player he needed a bit longer to get back to full fitness now very much back on the playing side of things than the coaching staff however in the meantime he did manage to get one of his coaching badges so clearly he's got some aspirations of doing that once his playing career has finished it seems to be a route that a lot of former Thai internationals are taking or ones that are coming to the end of the career and I think that's a good thing relatively young players who've got the experience are now getting into coaching and I I think from what I know of Cowan I think he'll make a good coach I, I would agree with that and I think Thai football it's it's evolving so quickly when you compare it to the other leagues that we hold dear and we respect like the English game the German league they've had hundreds of years to, to form themselves whereas the Thai league it's only really reached this real professional status within the last 10-20 years so I, I think we do need a younger crop there will be some experienced older heads that will be able to bring something to the coaching side but like you said it's good to have the younger guys in and I think that's something that we do really well at Mung Tong is um, those old legends that have retired we like having those guys around and, and the fans really appreciate seeing those 
those players still attached to the club as well. Yeah, I think they command quite a lot of respect, don't they, a lot of them, which is good to see. And especially with the younger players coming through as well, who are you know not that far behind in terms of age and development, but they can see and obviously they, they can relate to these guys. So yeah, I think it, it is a really positive thing. How long do you think he's going to keep playing? Well, he's got the advantage of being a goalkeeper and they seem to be able to keep going for a bit longer. You look at Sirawak, he's 39, 40, he's still winning medals for Buriram so Gowin looks like he takes care of himself there's been a few images you've seen around social media with his shirt off and certainly no issues with uh, diet and keeping himself in shape so I see no reason why he couldn't do the same there's always a little bit of fear that this injury could reoccur and and hamper that but potentially uh, another three four five years but for Montang, I think the crucial thing is it buys us a little bit of time. Coracourt this year came through and I think he's done well, but goalkeeper seems to be one of these positions that you've got to learn through experience. I mean, you rarely get a goalkeeper who just comes out 18 years of age, can do it all and is straight away the number one. And I was watching a podcast the other day with Ben Foster and they were talking about how in the English league, goalkeepers have to go out on loan for two, three, four seasons before they get the confidence of the club that they can then come back and take over as the number one goalkeeper so I think that's the main thing there he's bought us some time whether it's two years whether it's five years it gives us time to look at some of the younger goalkeepers and he can lend them a hand give them a few tips we can rotate here and there any extra playing time that he can give us it will be uh, very helpful for the club and I think if you're looking at topless pictures of Cowan on the internet Grant you're looking at different websites to the ones I look at <laughs> they're, they're, fan, they're fan groups it, it wasn't me putting them up there <laughs> no, no that's alright I wasn't accusing you of anything <laughs> no I have seen them and you're right he, he still is he's obviously kept in shape and he's he's looking good and, and he was always a commanding figure anyway wasn't he I think that was one of his big attributes that compared to a lot of goalkeepers we see in Thailand he was built really well and I think that's that's great to see that he's he's back and still in shape looking over his career obviously when he burst onto the scene he was next next big thing you know lots of great things were forecast for him do, do you think he's actually achieved everything that he could have done or do you think he's kind of fallen a little bit short of what we were expecting of him he maybe had the move to Europe didn't quite work out the way that we'd all hoped it would but credit to him for trying to break down that barrier uh, he could have stayed here in Thailand probably would, the next phase would have been to Japan a little bit earlier than he did go there and when he did go to Consadol from Belgium I think it was more a move out of necessity rather than some of the other players who've gone out on loan and there's been a, a little bit more thought behind the, the individual moves so a few disappointing transfers a few untimely injuries and have probably taken the gloss of his career but you still got to say he's one of Thailand's best ever goalkeepers. Obviously, he is coming to the end of the career. We've discussed this. So you must have some great memories of his, his first spell at Mong Tong. Any, any that particularly stand out? I think the the lack of memory of him fumbling, letting us down, um, is probably more significant. Just when he's in goal, you just feel a bit more reassured having him there and you can't underestimate that, that psychological advantage of the fans feeling that we're more secure having him there and, and that must have an impact on the defence as well but if I had to pick out one particular highlight I remember a Champions League qualifier in 2016 so it was the year we won the league but this would be the first game of the season and we just signed Chanitip and Tanabun in it it was their debuts and we had Johar in the qualifier and we probably should have won the game it went to extra time we had a few chances couldn't put it to bed but it ended up finishing nil-nil and went to a penalty shootout they had the first penalty they step up Gowin saves it we had our penalty we score Johar of their second penalty again he saves it we get our second penalty we score again Johar have their third one he does exactly the same thing like I've never seen that in a penalty shootout where the keeper has just been that commanding that he saved every single penalty and it was almost a bit of an anti-climax because penalties are normally quite a tentative affair but he was just absolutely ruthless he, he shut them out and then all we had to do was, was score three of our five and as it happened we'd scored our first three as well so we comprehensively won 
won that shootout. Yeah, he he was a marvelous goalkeeper uh, around about that that time period and helped us win quite a few trophies. I think that sums him up, really, doesn't it? You know, we've we've both used the word commanding, and that's what he is. You know, that's what he definitely brought to the team. Going back to what you were saying earlier, I think he's probably Thailand's best ever goalkeeper. And in all fairness, I'm delighted he's back. I, I really am. It's great to see him playing in the Thai league again, and I'm I'm just hoping he can carry on. And when he does eventually finish playing, I wish him all the success in his coaching career. As we've said, he's he's certainly got all the attributes to make a really good, successful coach. Yeah, top player and top man. Uh, I remember my, when my stepson met him around the stadium and asked for a picture and he, he was an absolute gentleman. Further to that, I'd add that part of the reason he's fit in so well back at the club is because his dear mother has always remained a loyal fan. So even when he was over in Belgium, Japan, even when he played for Port, his family would still be turning up to Mung Tong games, whole man away. Um, so he, he's always felt like he was still part of the Mung Tong community. I think that's a good point. And his, you know, his mum was always around. I, I can remember back in the early days, his mum was there, very supportive. That must help, you know, for a young player to, to know that your family's there and supporting you, whatever you do and whatever decision you make. And I think, you know, she and we say the whole family deserve a lot of credit as well for turning him into not just a great goalkeeper, but a, a fantastic person as well. Yeah, certainly seems like they've, they've kept him grounded. And I, I remember having a quick chat with her at Pratt Trap away a few seasons back and very nice people. That's brilliant. Lovely place to end it as well, Grant. So thanks so much for taking the time to come on and all the best to Cowan. Let's hope he does carry on playing because he does bring a lot to the table and he's one of the genuinely nice guys in Thai football. Someone who's an inspiration, I think, to a lot of youngsters as well. Well, I must put my hand up. I was one of the ones who was caught on a pair, Dale. And as we said during the course of our chat, he's such a good role model. I think he's the kind of player that a lot of Thai players need to look at and take inspiration from. Just the way he conducts himself, the way his, his career has gone, everything about him really is, is admirable, I think. And again, you know, if, if he does go into coaching, you know, I think we're looking at a, a future national team coach there, without any doubt. Well, that's good. And absolutely no disrespect to the young fella that he is disposed in goal. But when I went to the port game at, up at Montong, it just like a car crash at the back. You need that bit of experience and it'll bring on the other players around him. For me, that's that's, that's one of the things in Thai football that you don't really see. You don't see goalkeepers handing out bollockins to the defenders. But he is the kind of person who does that. And I think that's why he is head and shoulders above all others that I've seen. Certainly learnt from playing abroad. As we mentioned, the C word here, culture. It's not really the done thing, is it, on the pitch? No, but that, like you say, that's something that he's, he's certainly benefited from going and playing overseas. Anyway, to the national team, they've got two big games coming up. And we seem to be going into these with a renewed sense of optimism, I think it's fair to say. So next up is Jan, and Jan and I sat down, had a little conversation about the two games Thailand have got with South Korea over the next week. A Thai football podcast. So, a couple of Thailand international games coming up can only mean one thing, the return of Jian. Thank you, Dale. Uh, it's fun being the, the de facto national team correspondent now. This is great fun. Thank you. Yep, that's your official title, along with the voice of reason. So, you've, you've got quite a lot to live up to. Whoa. Oh, dear. <laughs> <laughs> Let's move straight on. Two big games coming up in the space of a few days for Thailand against South Korea, home and away, or away and home. I guess, if we're being more precise. Yeah. So, yeah. initial thoughts. You can talk about the squad first, if you like. Ishii's 23-man squad. As we expected, Ishii has gone with what I think is pretty much the same template as the Asian Cup, especially because during that tournament, he even said, sure, we, we want to do well in the Asian Cup. We're also seeing it as preparation for the World Cup qualifying. That's always an insane comment to make, because in my mind, the Asian Cup is the big deal. But, well, he, he said he wants to give as many players as he can experience players playing at the highest level in order to get them ready for World Cup qualifiers. Also, that was his reason for changing the whole 11 against Saudi Arabia as well in the last group game. So as we expect, he's picked pretty much the same squad with a few changes. Uh, he has to pick 23 players this time instead of 26 because that's the rules for this qualifiers. So he's dropped three players and he's switched three players with other players. So he's dropped Batompon, Chanarong and Jakapan Bryce Suwan from the team. Those three are out. And he's basically gone for like 
like for like changes. Picha out for Pukla. Warachit out for Chanatip, who's back from injury. And Tirasak out for Boromate. On each of those changes, I can completely see why. The Picha for Pukla, they're quite similar. Although, of course, I prefer my club captain, but that's his bias on my part. Chanatip, it's great to see him back. That was the big news when he was back. Photograph with the squad. Everyone's really hopeful. In my mind, I think he's more likely to be a super sub. To come off the bench and make a difference in the last 20 minutes if we need a goal. So to just add something a little bit extra. I think we'll see Super Chok start more more likely and try not to come off the bench to replace him. Especially since Super Chok has played, I think he started every game or came off the bench in one game so far for Sapporo this season in the J League that just started. So he's got options now. He's got two really really dangerous um, number 10s, if you will, in China Tip and, and Super Chok. But I doubt he'll play both because we are playing against Korea. We're a very tough side and you need to be a bit more defensively solid. He's kept the same sort of structure in defense. I saw one Thai Twitter account who compared who he picked as Supan and Pansa with Jonathan Kemdi at Ratchaburi, who has had a fantastic start to the well, second leg of the season so far. Where I think Ratchaburi have kept quite a few clean sheets. He's been the man of the match in quite a few games for them. But I'm not surprised that Ishii has pretty much picked the same squad in defense. I know he's been going around the country watching all sorts of games. T1 games, T2 games. He's traveled up and down the country watching as many players as possible. But I think that's more for later. So the King's Cup, the AFF Cup, were the experiment. For now, with these two World Cup qualifiers against Korea and then two more against China and Singapore, it's about just doing what works and grinding out results. And I'm not surprised that he's he's, he's gone and done that. And also shout out to, to Boramate, who he picked for the national team, replacing Tirasak. And Boramate went and rewarded his, well, his confidence by scoring a hat-trick for Muang Tong last weekend. So encouraging signs. The players who are picked look like they're on form. I think our attack is is in good shape. I think Super Chai is in great form. Super Chok, Boromate, Chanatip, Supanat. I think we're we can get at them on the counter attack. And I, I think there's reason to think that you know what we might not get rolled over twice. Maybe we can get something from one of those games. I think that's got to be the the aim, hasn't it? Anything other than a defeat in Korea would be classed mm. as a success. I think at home there's there's no reason why we we can't be a little bit more adventurous. It's a sellout, isn't it? So I believe yep. at, at Rajamangala yep. for the re- the return game. So it'd be mm. nice to see us have a go. I mean, a lot probably will depend on the first match. But as he's shown in the the AFC tournament, the recent one, he can adapt the tactics and the style of play to suit the opposition. And the players he has seem quite adaptable, and they're able to fit in with what he wants. Would would you say that's a fair observation? Yeah, absolutely. I think he's shown that, and he's he's held his own against sort of big teams. The fact that we kept the clean sheet against Saudi Arabia with our wholly fully rotated 11 is a source of really big confidence for me I think we we actually can do the hard the hard work of of you know defending our goal back to goal when we need to and of course with the attacking talent we have we can always turn it on going forward I think even one point from these two games would be would be great it'd be fantastic I mean we get one point against Korea and then we get a point in Beijing and a win in, against Singapore we should be through with that assuming that China lose both their games to Korea we'll, we should be through so one draw will be huge two draws absolutely amazing and somehow if we get three points from, from these games it'd be even even better it's worth noting actually that, that South Korea are in a little bit of a crisis themselves I mean I don't think it affects it that much I think they're still comfortably far far better than us even on their worst day but they're in a bit of a crisis Sun Hyung Min and Lee Kang In who are two of the biggest players in South Korea have been having some tension I believe and uh, they have an interim manager at the moment I'm sure your your Korean guests will will discuss this more but they've got an interim manager who I think is their U23 manager who's come in these will be his only games he's only interim for these two games and international football like these sort of vibes these sort of you know team spirit and togetherness can make a really big difference because it's a one-off game or a two-legged game and that's it. It's not like they're with the, with the coach every every day, every week. They, he, they've they got to get themselves together really quickly. And I think the fact that Ishii's pretty much has to say, all right, boys, just go do it again. We'll do what you've already done. Versus Korea have a lot more work to do rebuilding their team spirit after the managerial change and Jurgen Klinsmann leaving. I think we we can be a little bit hopeful this time that we can actually go and get something, which would, which would be huge. I agree. I think this is probably the best time to be playing them I mean mm. ideally Klinsman would still be in charge and they'd still be in <laughs> lots of chaos and turmoil but yeah. coming off the back of that I, th- I think it's a great time to play them because as you just said it is difficult when you've got all these egos and all these big name players and for someone mm. to come in if he is the under 23 coach to come in and to try and get them to perform and to try and heal a few rifts 
in the wake of what went on is going to be his first big challenge. And the flip side of that is is Thailand now seem to be very stable. They've got a very good squad. As you said, all the players seem to be at the top of the game. Ishii will be a lot more relaxed, a lot more settled. He's got his, his three-year contract. So I, I think you, you couldn't really pick a better time to play South Korea than now in back-to-back yeah, back yeah. games as well. And, you know, when they do come to Thailand, I don't, I'm not sure what the capacity is at Rajamangala now, 39, 40,000, is it? Is it 49,000? Am I off with that? I thought it was 49,000. Yeah. yeah well, thought... Whatever it is, a full Rajamangala right yeah. behind the, the Thai side is, you know, it's it's quite, can be quite intimidating. I mean, I the first game I ever saw in Thailand was a, a World Cup qualifier, Thailand against South Korea in 97. Ooh. And we lost 3-1. And it was, it was very low key. I mean, I, you know, I was taking in as much as I could, but that was low key. But then obviously the following year, the Asian Games quarter final, without doubt, one of the greatest nights I've ever spent watching football. There must have been 70,000 people in that ground that night. It was certainly an overcapacity. The yeah. atmosphere was tremendous. And, you know, with nine men, we managed to beat them. It was just a once in a lifetime experience. But I, I think, like I say, I think this is this is probably the best time to play them. And who knows, you know, we go there and get a point. I wouldn't rule out a win back in Bangkok. Wow. Yeah, if we got a win, that would really solve a lot of problems for us because we we did lose to China at home, which means we have to go to Beijing and get a point. If we get a point in Beijing and a point against Korea, we're, we're good. If we lose both these games, we have to go and win in Beijing by two goals or more. So yeah, a point, a point would help us a lot. A win would be pretty much, would be fantastic because I, I don't see China beating Korea once Korea get their new manager in once things are a bit more settled. I think the next round of games are in June even, right? Or end of May, early June. By then, Korea will hopefully have figured it out and they'll go beat China for us. So yeah, perfect time to play them. They're a bit unstable. Let's get at them and and, and try and get something and not be afraid of them. That's the perfect attitude. Let's let's hope that that's the approach they that they do take. I'd like to see that. It's an exciting young squad. And, you know, as, as we've said, the, the talent is there and the, they are capable of a lot more. And I think, you know, the, the AFC tournament has given us good reason to be optimistic I think for the future I'm very optimistic our front line especially very young and very very good Super Chai is having time of his life right now Buriram Supanat's making his name in, in Belgium Super Chok's a regular now in Japan and we've got an old defense but that's great it's an experienced defense the thing I was most worried about was our defense but when you go and keep a clean sheet for an entire group stage then clearly something's gone right Ishii turned our our biggest weakness into our strength somehow and that that's obviously a huge boost so looking forward to seeing these games for once I'm not horrified I'm actually looking forward to the games we'll leave it on a positive note (laughs) and let's hope it doesn't come back to bite us on the backside thanks so much Jan really appreciate your insight as always hopefully we'll get you on after the next couple of games and we can have a bit bit of a recap and hopefully we'll be celebrating some good results yeah, I want to be really optimistic, Dale. And, and I suppose, in a way, there's a good chance with South Korea changing bosses as well. And this has just had that little bit of extra time, hasn't he, to sort of implant his theories on his side. He has. And again, you know, you mentioned it the other week about his contract, which makes a lot of sense. You know, there's that gives that consistency and he'll be a lot more settled, I think, knowing that he, you know, he's not in it just for a few weeks or a couple of months or for one tournament. And the there does seem to be a lot of optimism. I mean, it could all come crashing down, couldn't it? The, the reality, I think, is we're going to lose. Certainly in South Korea, the best we can probably hope for in, in Thailand is a draw. But I, ju- I just hope for a good performance, really. Show everyone what we're capable of and what we can do. That's all we can ask for, really, isn't it, I think, at, at this moment? It, it is, but it's a free punch, isn't it? It can go for it without any fear of criticism. To be honest, I, I think it would have been more beneficial to Thailand if Klinsmann has, had a still been in charge because they were a mess weren't they and you know a lot of the stories that came out after that last tournament weren't great reading and you know and you see top professionals and and people you know like son from spurs coming out saying what he did and what was going on was was quite a worry really it is i mean Klinsman obviously an outstanding football and i quite like him as a bloke listening to interviews but he's not a good manager, is he? No, it wasn't a good fit at all, was it? No, it was a typical fit of high profile, wasn't it? Trying to boost things. And it, it doesn't work. It's proven time and time again. Like Preston bringing Bobby Charlton in as manager. 
Well, I mean, we are showing our age. Great players don't always make great managers or coaches. Hi, my name is Anthony, and I'm listening to a Thai football podcast. Continuing the South Korean theme, we've got a new contributor joining us now. This is Michael. Now, Michael spent a lot of time in South Korea. He contributed to the K-League United podcast. He's done a lot of writing as well about South Korean football, but he's recently moved to Thailand and he's keen to start following the local game. So he's coming on now. He's going to start with the T2 roundup and then we'll chat briefly about the forthcoming internationals and get a South Korean perspective on things. A Thai football podcast. Hi, Michael. How are you doing, mate? Uh, hello. Uh, thanks for having me on. Um, I'll just I'll introduce myself a little bit if you don't mind. So um, I am still a contributor for K League United. So uh, Korean football is my specialty. But um, I moved, made the move after seven years to Thailand uh, this January, and I'm hoping to you know dip my feet, my toes into the Thai football scene and see how it goes. And um, we will be talking about Korea slightly later. But I think initially you want to talk about. T2, is that right? Yes. Yeah. So um, in Korea, my, my team that I followed was Seoul Eland, who played in the K League 2. I had a completely open canvas to choose any team I wanted in the Thai League, and I've gone for a Thai League 2 team. So I'm a glutton for punishment. So which which team have you chosen, dare I ask? I'm a fan of Pattaya United. I, I am a believer in support your local, and I am currently living in Pattaya. So it is a team I've gone to see a few times now. And, you know, that playoff push is in the grasp still for them. Yeah, they've turned it around, haven't they, in recent weeks? They they had a little stumble, but they seem to have picked up again just at the right time, really. Yes, and, and you know, there's five games left to go, and some of the games they've got, that they should, knowing the quality of the side, playing three points. So looking at teams around them, they are the favourites to, to take that last spot. So given the current state of T2, what are, what are your overall impressions? I've been saying for a long time that the top two look pretty much nailed on to go up. And then it is that fight, isn't it, for the playoff places and the lottery that will follow. So what what have you made of the recent results and the, the current state of play in the second tier? First thing that I notice is there's not really a relegation battle this year, is the um, Customs United, Crab Yessi, and is it Kesetsap? The, the 10 points adrift off 15th place during Kanchanabori. So I think the, the relegation side of it, those three teams I mentioned, they're, they're going down. Moving up the table, as you said, the two teams at the top, it looks like it's going to be between them two to, to, to take the title, really. And they'll be playing now just to see who can actually claim the trophy by the end of the season. It does get a little bit interesting when you go down the places because, you know, you've got, was it, Nokonsi on 54 points, Chiang Mai on 53, Rayong on 50, and then Pattaya United. United on 45 and they are the playoff spots at the moment slightly below uh, Batai United is, is Ayutthaya on 42 so they're only you know they're only a one game swing away from leapfrogging Batai United I think the teams above them that they're more than less secure the playoff space but I think that's 6-1 it could go to a number of teams you know the real interesting thing about the Thai League 2 in these last five games will be who will claim their uh, sixth place it is very tight but as I mentioned at the start Patrick have, have come into form just at the right time they did have that little wobble but the recent results have been good and they've been playing well how many games have you managed to get to down there this season I think I've been to about six or seven now to be honest because um, I tell you what I, I came here in October to visit the work, work purposes and I managed to get two games so I went on the Saturday and ended up going on the Wednesday as well but I think it's about six seven games I've been to now so you know it's, it's really fun to go there you know it's a, it's a it's a different aspect than Korean football definitely with the with the chanting and the profanity <laughs> that is heard in the, in the stadium compared to Korea. That that was a culture shock for me. What are your impressions of the the setup down there? I think uh, you're probably aware that it's. I mean, Patty is unique. I think it's fair to say in the makeup of the city. Obviously, you, you get a lot of foreigners who who live there or work there or who've settled there, and that is reflected in the the crowds they get down at Nong Pru. You've already mentioned the profanities that get shouted in probably about seven or eight different languages. So it's it's very good for your your language skills. I think to spend. <laughs> afternoon at Patia but what what about the experience the match day experience how do you feel about that and how does it compare with with what you're used to I, I think it's great and um, I only really have positive things to say about it you know the the price of admission is like 120 baht you can get a good few beers in there for like I think 80 baht a beer and that's a that's a large one you know they've got food section there and, you know everyone I spoke to there Thais and foreigners they've been really friendly and you know there's some songs that Thais sing that I would completely in English 
So it feels like quite a welcoming club. It's quite a unique stadium because three of the four, um, I'm trying to think if there even is a, a temporary stand on the west side of the goal, but there's definitely two temporary stands and then they've got one main stand. It's an unusual little ground. I mean, a, a little bit of history that you, you're probably not aware of. It is a school playing field. You, you probably know that because you've got the school building behind the main stand. And when Patia first came into the league, there were plans to build a 20,000-seater stadium. So this was 2009, which has suddenly resurfaced. So it looks like that project is back on again. And Nompru was always going to be a temporary arrangement, but obviously it's been temporary for 15 years. As, as you probably get out more and get to more games and visit more stadiums, you'll see that many of them, certainly in the top flight, and even quite a few in in the second tier are very good grounds you know they've they're purpose built they've got good stands they've got good views of the pitch you've got all the facilities you would expect at a top flight stadium in any country in the world really so it'll be interesting to get your views on that when you've you've seen a bit more and you can compare your experiences at Patia to places you see elsewhere um, I've not done an away game yet with Pattaya United but I do have my eye on that last game of the season when they're playing is it Samuel uh, Prakan I've got my eyes on that being the first away game for me and take it from there okay well a, a word of warning and I'm not going to go into too much detail here because there's quite a lot of history here between not just the two clubs but the the precursors of Pattaya United as well but when those two teams played at the start of the season there was quite a bit of trouble at the game because the original Pattaya United were taken over and moved to some up Prakan City so the club you're seeing now is a, is a Phoenix club there's a lot of ill feeling there between it's certainly I, I think it's more one side I think it's more the Pattaya fans have a lot of resentment towards some up Prakan City and like I said this manifested itself in, in a bit of trouble which is very unusual for, for Thai games so you very very occasionally get something but it's certainly not something that happens often thankfully there was talk at the time whether away fans would be banned so you might be lucky if you <laughs> if you can get to that game as an away fan some subterfuge might need to be employed there to get you into the ground it'll certainly be a good atmosphere if, if you do get to go no pressure there Michael it sounds more and more like I might have to go a undercover and just sit in the home and <laughs> false beard and glasses and all the rest of it I mean, like I say, it's, nothing's been sorted yet, so it might not happen. You might be okay. Hopefully common sense will prevail. It was one of these things that you thought if there was something resting on it, it could be quite a volatile atmosphere. But if things have been decided by then, I, I don't think there'd be any uh, anything to worry about. But we'll, we'll just have to wait and see. Yeah, well, definitely if it goes to the last game of the season and Patai United need a win or even a draw or something, then it would be very, very tense really so I'm looking forward to even more now that I know this history <laughs> there's a lot more to it than that as well Michael which we won't go into just now but it, it often gets overlooked that Patty United actually took another club's place in the league which a lot of their fans choose to overlook or might not even be aware of but that's that's another story for another day anyway obviously you've got lots of experience with Korean football and I can't let you go without mentioning the fact that the next two big games for the Thailand national team are both against South Korea. So what are your thoughts on the current state of the South Korean national team? Obviously quite a tumultuous tournament recently, which ended in Jürgen Klinsmann being relieved of his duties. And there seems to have been a bit of a transitional period, I think, at the moment. Is that fair to say? The quality that South Korea have in the national team themselves actually is very good at the moment. If, if you just think of some of the players, obviously Son Hun Min, Lee Gang in there, uh, Kim Min Jae, you know, I've just named three players off the top of my head there who have played very fantastic football at club level. And, you know, they could and should be replicating that for the national team. But the direction that the KFA are going in at the moment, they, they just don't seem to know what they're doing. They, they brought in Jorgen Klinsmann and they, they set up, I remember last year they set up really easy easy friendlies so that he could get his like win rate up and just like start kicking on with with the team but you know I'm looking at the fixtures here they drew 2-2 to Colombia you know, they, they lost to Uruguay lost to Peru 1-1 with El Salvador these are games which were you know they should have taken something from it but they didn't they didn't do so I did watch I did follow them quite a lot in the the Asian Cup and you know extra time Saudi Arabia extra time Australia okay that was a very good game and then they just absolutely flopped against Jordan Jordan completely deserved that game at I, honestly, I didn't know who I was watching. Obviously, it came out as a bit of an issue what, with Sun Hun Min and Yi Kang In, really, um, in truth. But the national team looks like it doesn't have a direction at the moment. And still now, they have a caretaker manager, um, Hang Sung Hong. 
I would not be surprised if Thailand would be able to take a, a point in one of the games here now, because let's be completely honest, I think the Korean national team is still very, very good and they'll have no issues in qualifying for the World Cup. But, you know, if Thailand can upset them, then it'll be two very interesting games. I think there's a lot of optimism around the Thailand national team at the moment. There was a, a huge issue with the previous coach. A lot of behind the scenes shenanigans went on, which were particularly pleasant. And Ishii came in on the back of all that. And I think he he was quite heavily involved as well. So he, he came in for a lot of criticism. But his, the performances at the AFC Asian Cup and what he's done since seem to have galvanised everyone. Everyone seems now to be behind him. And there is a lot of optimism looking towards the future. Now, obviously, these are two tough games. I don't think anybody's fooling themselves any otherwise, regardless of where South Korea are at in terms of, you know, the post Klinsman era. But we're feeling quite optimistic. And it was interesting that you said, you know, a point would be a good result there because that's that's what, you know, we're thinking it's not beyond the realms of possibility now. And then when South Korea come to Bangkok, that's a completely different story. I mean, obviously they're all experienced, you know, they've played in front of big crowds. A lot of them play in the top leagues in the world. But... A packed house in Bangkok can be quite intimidating and the Thais will be up for it. So I think it's it's going to be tough to call, isn't it, really? Yeah, and, and, and the same could be said as well when the game's going to be in Seoul because the Red Army, the Taewoki Warriors, they create an atmosphere too when they, they, they mostly play in Seoul, but sometimes they do mix up a bit and play in different stadiums. So for that to then be replicated in Bangkok, it'll be... Two, two games I'm really looking forward to. Um, I was trying to get to Bangkok for the game, but I couldn't, and there was no chance of me getting to Seoul for it. But so I will have to be watching that on television. So that's been great. Thank you so much for coming on. Really appreciate it. And look forward to your future contributions as well, and certainly our updates on T2. And once you start going to other grounds as well, that would be great to get your opinions. It's always great to get a fresh perspective on things. You know, some things you think, oh, that's not quite right, or I wish we did this better. To hear someone come in and say, oh, wow, this is actually really good. You know, it's, it's better than what I'm used to. It's, it's, it's quite refreshing. So thank you for that. Enjoy the rest of your week and look forward to speaking again soon. Thank you very much for having me on. I look forward to being on again. So, yeah, thank you very much. Yeah, welcome on board, Michael. Great start. Lovely to have you with us. And, and a younger voice as well, Dale. That's it. Well, we've had two young people, three if you include Grant, I don't know, <laughs> on, the, on this week's podcast. So we are getting away from that grumpy old men reputation that we've probably got, Rob. Hi, my name is Jamie and I'm listening to a Thai football podcast. To end this week, we've got Rob out and about on his travels. We spoke to Mark Watson, the owner of Futera United at length last week, and Rob thought he'd pay them a visit. And these are imp his impressions on Futera's home game with Dome FC. Rob, Rob, Yes, this afternoon's Rob's Roving Report coming to you from the KMITL Stadium, Black Krabang. And today's game, an intriguing battle. It's the second place. Butera United, who was featured heavily on last week's show, and well worth a listen, I recommend that. And they're up against Dome FC. Both former members of the Thai League, been missing for quite some time, desperate to go back up to the national setup. If Butera win today, they go on point above Dome. So a vital game in the history of both clubs really. This is the first time in this campaign that Futura are using their designated home ground. They've played other games at other stadiums so far. They've been awarded a 2-0 win for a, a walkover against EGY and they've drawn their other two games. So unbeaten. But I'm sure that Dome will have plenty to say. Dome uh, who belong to Tamasak University where uh, Bangkok United ply their trade. I once went to one of their games in uh, T4, rattling around with 50 other desperados against BG United uh, second team. Stadium in a fine location. Many of you have probably passed it without really uh, realising. It's at the end of the Sabanaboom uh, and Pattaya Junction. So when you do a right out of Sabanaboom heading towards the coast, you go past it. There's four imposing floodlights and a big stand. And we're going to have regular flyovers. We're right underneath the flight path to Savannah Boom. In fact, there's one coming, so I'll, I'll 
I'll carry on nattering just for a few seconds so you get some idea of the noise. Uh, it'd be interesting to see the crowd. They've got 450 the last time when they were playing nearer their academy base. This stadium uh, over the other side. There's a plane coming in now. So if a goal uh, report's interrupted by a plane, now you know the reason why. <laughs> So, yes, yeah, still, I'm uh, joined by Mark Watson, owner hey. of Fatura. How are you doing, Rob? It's been 10 years, mate, since I last saw you at a game. Yeah, that's right. Incredible. Oh, wow. Time flies. Yeah, uh, big hopes for this afternoon. Yeah, I'm nervous about today. The Dome are classically the best amateur team in the country, and now they've gone into the semi-pros against us. We played them once before in our history. We played them in the TA quarterfinals. Uh, one all, and then lost on penalties. So there's a little bit of needle there. We uh, Today's an important game for us. We want to sort of write that one. Not so, half. Not half. Uh, I've done some research, believe it or not, for this, and uh, I see that you you played my local club, CSK United, in the Cup a couple of years ago. Yes, yeah. So uh, 2022, I went down there as well. I think it was like, eight hours we got on the bus. Yeah. Went down there. We did all right that day. What's, yeah. What's quite interesting about today is we've got a centre back. He's only five foot five. His name's Jude, playing at the back. He hasn't played at the back since that game, and he was phenomenal that game. He's normally a midfielder, attacking midfielder, but um, when we have our biggest games, we pull him back into defence. So today we're doing the same thing. So two years, and uh, we're trying out again. Basically. That's great stuff. And you've got the regular holders sending in your advice of you this afternoon. Yeah, biggest votes probably ever for this game. So uh, we're playing a centre back up front after looking at training and seeing that he's got he can finish basically. So that's great. We've got. Uh, left winger that hasn't played for a while we started today and we've got the centre midfielder now playing at centre back as well so it sounds a bit crazy but there is method to the madness at the moment. it's good to have fans involved as you, you said in your interview last week yeah it was so important to the club so important for us to it, it's like a sort of it, it feels like a micro Premier League club if we lose today I find out about it straight away online like we know <laughs> that if we've made mistakes etc we get sort of stick from it which all adds to the, the fun of it so yeah no it's fingers crossed mate today this is this is a big one for us no great stuff Matt all the best for today in a second. How Futera were not awarded a penalty a moment ago. It's one that uh, we, we do lament uh, the actions of our interrupting games but uh, I'm sure they would have had a very close look at an incident a few seconds ago. From this angle I thought it was a stonewall penalty. The referee gave a corner. 1-0 after 20 minutes. Well the game's already straight and we're only in the 23rd minute. From in front of goal, nobody knows. Whoever marks on the back post couldn't connect properly. The ball fell to a guy on the six yard line right in the centre and he blasted over. Still 1 0 for Terra. Well, we just passed the half hour mark and uh, Dorma struck the Fatera woodwork. I'll tell you what, if I was still a smoker there, uh, uh, coincided with being a Fatera older, I'd been to my second packet by now. I've never seen a breathless game like it. We had a quiet first 10 minutes and ever since it's all action. Tremendous stuff here at KMITL. <laughs> The half time whistle's been blown here at KMITL. And I tell you what, that was breathless. Really good football. And I'm getting double entertainment sat behind Mark and a fellow older of Fatera who were really going through it. Fantastic stuff. And just uh, a footnote teams are not allowed to play foreign players in this competition, which is probably a good way stops teams buying the way to promotion. So, let's see what the second half will bring. I hope it's as entertaining as the first half. 1 0 for Terra at the break. Well, we're just a few minutes into the second half and a slick passing move. Got caught out at the back slightly for Terra. The keeper probably conceded a penalty. Referee played advantage, not for the first time. The ball put into the empty net. 1 1. <laughs> 
Well, we're on the hour mark here, Dale, and I've just seen one of the best tackles all season. The defender that Mark talked about has been converted from a forward. He dashed across the area and lunged into the dome player, caught the ball at the same time as the man, completely clean, but both players laid out at the moment. Absolute cruncher of a challenge. Impeccably timed. Still 1-1. Well, Dorma just hit the crossbar for a second time and uh, one feels that if Fatira get anything out of this game they're going to really have to work hard for it. Coming on strong the team in all white after 63 minutes. Indeed, well, maybe I had an epiphany. The resulting corner, great save by the keeper but lashed in from close range. 2-1 to the visitors. 3-1 to Dorma, fantastically well worked. So, slotted past the keeper. I'm afraid for Tira's uh, lack of keeping all the positions coming back to bite them more and more. They look a tired side, they've given everything. The guy who put in the great challenge earlier had to go off, and uh, that hasn't helped them. Put everything in, you cannot fault their effort, but don't look a quality act on this performance. 3 1 to the visitors. <laughs> Yes, more and more gaps opening up in the Fatera defence. It's important they don't let their heads go down because they've made a fine account of themselves this afternoon. But Dom are a very good side, fit and strong, and they've got tactics. You can tell that they play together regular. A fine goal, the fourth. Rounded the keeper and a powerful finish past the defender on the line. <laughs> Full time here at KMIT, Alan Lankraban. Final score for Tura United 1, Dorm FC 4. In the end, uh, the score looks like an easy game, but for at least an hour, for Tura well in it. Fitness counting in the end. Both sides will be thoroughly exhausted at the end of this encounter. Great entertainment for the healthy crowd. And Dorm look favourites on this showing for promotion to Tura three. a Fatira home game. Well that's all for today. Final score for Tira 1, Dorm 4. Yes, Dale, good afternoon out. No controversy either. Both teams played it in excellent spirit. The action between the 15th and 45th minute was incredibly stretched, fantastic to watch. And it was good fun watching with those with real skin in the game, watching them go through absolute torture. Thanks for the warm welcome, Mark, by the way. There was a guy there, well, a team there, in fact, doing lots of camera work. There is apparently a documentary coming out on Fatiri United. Oh, that'll be worth watching. I mean, I did managed to see the game on YouTube the, the coverage was excellent Mark hinted at the commentary the other week and the commentary is definitely worth listening to if you get the chance it's very funny and just to add lovely company as well of Sven who contributes so much to helping us find information lovely to meet him for the first time yeah I think Sven's contribution to Thai football can't be underestimated can it he does a heck of a lot of work and he gets things out there and he shares it we're going to keep working on you Sven we're going to get you on the podcast one week don't worry we'll keep chipping away till you agree <laughs> I'll have to pop something in his water when he's not watching <laughs> so that's that's it if you want to come on the show we're, we're willing to drug you and kidnap you just to get you on the podcast be warned I think we better leave it there Rob we don't want to get ourselves in trouble do we no it's a, it's a reputation I don't particularly want to be earning here in Bangkok <laughs> <laughs> oh dear All right, it's a brave man who keep that in the edit let's see <laughs> have fun everywhere, wherever you are and try and get to some football this weekend and thanks everyone for listening and thanks to Grant Jan and Michael and we'll see you all next week 